delighted to be here. Um, and the, the prayer is, you know, better than anything I have to offer on the topic, I'm afraid, <laughs> because in a way that thematizes um, the whole topic of practical wisdom. Um, I am, and I turn to Aquinas for help on this topic. Um, I turn to Aquinas for help on almost everything, um, truth be told. So this will be partly a way of reading Aquinas on this topic and partly a way of trying to lace Aquinas together with some other kinds of material on the topic of practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is a virtue, I mean, for Aquinas, an intellectual virtue that works on the will. Um, and for it's become a really popular virtue among social scientists lately. So there's a lot of work that gets done on practical wisdom. They adopt the Aristotle term for it and call it phronesis. They think of it as a sort of a master virtue, as one that coordinates all the other virtues and so on. There's an element of that, I think, uh, in Aquinas on this on Prudentia as well. But I don't think there's a, a very clear and straightforward... Um, I don't think you can just move from phronesis in Aristotle to Prudentia in Aquinas and have exactly the same topic that you're discussing. Um, and I don't think that you're using working on exactly the same topic in social sciences either, but they're related. Okay, here goes. If you want to understand what's happening when a frog detects the movement of a small invertebrate nearby, catches and swallows it, or when a dog lowers the front half of its body to the ground while keeping its rear end up in the air just before charging at another dog, you need to understand the point or the good of such behavior in the life of a dog or a frog. The end is served by such movement may be relatively straightforward, that frog is eating, or highly complex, the dog is signaling playful intentions to another dog before rushing it. But you can't so much as correctly identify the events unfolding in front of you without a basic teleological orientation to the kinds of animal you're watching and the sorts of things that count as, you know, eating or playing for animals of the relevant kind. To understand these events, you operate with a fundamental orientation to what is good or bad for frogs or dogs, and if the events in front of you do not make sense to you in those terms, you will do well to begin by trying to ascertain what sort of good is at issue for the relevant kind of animal that is exhibiting such and such a sort of movement or behavior. Now, Aquinas takes over this kind of a framework from Aristotle and enlarges upon it and develops the Aristotelian insight in thinking about human beings. For Aquinas, to understand the processes characteristic of a kind of living thing is to see those processes as directed to the, to the good of a creature of that kind or away from what's bad for such a being. This is, you know, basically an Aristotelian condition on the intelligibility of animal movement. Put bluntly, if you can't see the good or point of the puppy's endearing play, you don't really understand what you're seeing. The framework extends to understanding the functioning of the organs and biological processes characteristic of the kind of animal under consideration, and it extends to us. Now, we know a lot, science has progressed. <laughs> We know a lot more about all of this than Aquinas did. But I think that we learned all these things by working within the basic Aristotelian teleological framework that animates Aquinas' work. That framework is still in place. Uh -oh. I can talk about that if you want in question and answer. Like the movement of dogs and frogs, 
human activity is meant to go toward things that are good for humans and away from things that are bad for us. This principle is required to grasp everything from the characteristic operations of our inner organs to what we eat, how we interact with our fellow creatures, how we conduct research, how and when we rest or play. The human being is, for Aquinas, the highest of animals and the lowest of intellectual creatures. So we sort of sit between the top of one and the bottom of the other. Those two points taken together make it the case that human beings are the animals that have to figure out what to do and when and why. Other sorts of forces tend to take care of that, Aquinas thinks, in the lives of other animals. Now, this all by itself might not have been, you know, especially challenging if our perceptions and appetites and understanding were always, you know, harmoniously coordinated in such a way that we tended to reasonable pursuit of human good and reasonable avoidance of what's bad for us. I mean, we might need some help learning about what things were good or bad for us so that we could, and how to coordinate pursuit and avoidance accordingly. Uh, and, you know, of course, we could be derailed by illness or injury. Still, leading a well-ordered life might not have been really hard. But managing reasonable pursuit of good and reasonable avoidance of bad is hard for us. I mean, take a look at the news one day. Um, and we're not just at risk of, you know, inefficiency or disappointment if we're misdirected. Unlike other animals, we are at moral risk. We risk wickedness if we mess up. I think that Aquinas recognized that among animals, at least, things are sort of uniquely hard for us. We get in the way of ourselves even when we're fully grown and of relatively sound mind and body. We get in our own way even when we are, as one says, highly functional. Aquinas understands that even the best of us will have good reason to regret some of what we do or fail to do, say or fail to say, think or fail to think. You could, I can be as practically wise as you please. It's probably not going to obviate the need for confession. <laughs> An important distinction between Aquinas and Aristotle. <laughs> she, like the Phronimos has no reason to regret anything ever by the sound of it. Okay, we're not entirely at sea. We're not left to sort of punch holes in a kind of nothingness without so much as a clue about what punching might amount to. Um, we have, he thinks, built into us natural reason and a habit he calls syndaresis. Now, syndaresis is the basic practical orientation toward human good. Aquinas writes, quote, just as we have been naturally endowed with principles regarding speculative objects, and theoretical reasoning, so too we have been naturally endowed with principles regarding actions. Now the first principles regarding speculative ob objects that we have been naturally endowed with do not involve any special power, but instead involve a special habit which is called the intellective understanding of principles. Hence, the principles that we have been naturally endowed with regarding actions do not involve a special power either, but instead involve a special natural habit, which we call syndaresis. Hence, syndaresis is said to goad us toward what is good and to murmur about what is bad insofar as we, A, we proceed to discover things on the basis of the first principles, and B, we pass judgment about what has been discovered. Okay, so um, a, a natural goad toward human good that murmurs at what's bad for humans is, in effect, a practical orientation lined up with those formal requirements on the intelligibility of human action as such. 
But reading Sendarius's is no more than an orientation toward good. I mean, what's great about that is it gives you an easy way of thinking about some of the things that Aquinas says about Sendarius's, that it's infallible, for example, um, that it has to be in each of us, that it can't be blotted out of our hearts, those kinds of things, which can seem perplexing at first glance. Um, like, really? <laughs> I've got an infallible guide to good, I wish I, it spoke more loudly. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, I mean, so Sindaris is, in this very formal way, it sets the terms for the intelligibility or understandability of human action as such. But it has to do more than that. It has to provide some substantive guidance. Now, um, a habit is a sort of, is a sort of, habits for Aquinas are these complex dis dispositions to sort of act and react in some ways rather than others. And these are necessary to sound human action on his view. Um, they involve interlocking, I think it's easiest to say, interlocking patterns of inference and motivation. Like how do you respond? What are, the re what are things you take to be reasons for doing stuff? How do the motivations work? They have to be, uh, one of these habits has both of these aspects, I think. Um, even if it's not one of the things he signals as a particular as a habit involving passions especially, or intellect especially. Uh, um, and the acquired, the acquired habits are, that are supposed to help us are basically the moral virtues, right, um, for the most part. But the natural habits are different from the acquired habits, not just because they, we don't go through an explicit period of being taught them or learning them or something like that. They're supposed to be there from the get-go. But because they have the opposite effect of sort of Aristotelian virtues. Um, a really great Aristotelian virtue, if you've got one, um, according to Aristotle, drives out deliberation. It makes it easier and more automatic to do the kind of thing you're supposed to do in the relevant dimension. So if you have acquired courage, you are automatically prepared to stand your ground for something worthwhile. And you're good, at automatically good, at being able to tell the difference between things that it's worth being afraid of and things that it's not worth being afraid of. Courage is supposed to do all of that for you. The natural habits, instead of driving out deliberation, are the seeds of it. They spark a bunch of thinking. So the natural habits of first principles in speculative reason make you apt to learn about thinking and apt to learn about learning and help direct your investigation of the world that you're moving around in and help you take what's useful and important and true from it. Sindaresis makes you apt for acquisition of the moral virtue, I think. Um, and I mean, I'm pretty. Uh, I'm pretty willing to think that if we wanted to try to map some of the things that Aquinas has to offer about Sindaresis onto some regions of human psychology, in early childhood developmental psychology is a great place to look the kind of incredible beauty and complexity of the way in which the really little human enters into the human community. Um, and that being very, very powerful and necessary part of every very, very little human's development. <laughs> um, so all kinds of stuff about language acquisition and stuff becomes really interesting and 
I take it that the incredible, the deep sociality that makes it possible for these little beings to do the amazing feats that they do cognitively in such a short period of time, that, that kind of sociality and ready willingness to bond and stuff is, I think, one of the kinds of things that you could treat as an, as an aspect of syndesis. Um, and it's there from the very beginning. It's kind of amazing. Okay, now. So, this basic orientation will be what makes my actions understandable, my deliberate human acts understandable. Unfortunately, what's understandable in humans' ways of moving around in the world dramatically exceeds the range of ways of organizing one's life that count as tending to reasonable and harmonious pursuit of human good or avoidance of what's bad. Um, folly, greed, pettiness, cowardice, injustice, despair, cruelty, certain forms of forgetfulness, negligence, callousness, selfishness, and a wide range of sort of more unusual boutique practical orientations can be perfectly understandable in this minimal sense. They can qualify as directed toward human good or away from things that are bad for humans. It's just that the direction is not very well established. Okay. So. Acquired virtues, I mean practical wisdom will be, I'm going to be talking about acquired practical wisdom. Um, acquired practical wisdom is supposed to be invaluable in helping us cope with the sort of disorder that seems to come to us in so many ways so natural. Um, it is a cardinal virtue. For obvious reasons, acquired virtues um, develop through education, acculturation, practice, and as such, the nascent forms of these begin in dense and complex attachments to caretakers very early in life. These are the strengths that are, interest, are most interesting to um, American, I mean, English-speaking philosophers, most interesting to educators and most interesting to social scientists. The other sort of virtue that is really important for Aquinas is, of course, infused virtue, strength that comes from God and orients us to a supernatural end. Acquired virtues orient us to this life and to doing things appropriately in this life. That's why, for somebody like Aquinas, acquired virtue, even the lion's share of it couldn't possibly be the highest thing to go for for a human being. The highest thing to go for for a human being is a supernatural end involving union with God and a resurrected life. Infused virtues are directed that way. But let's think about the acquired one. Um, okay. Moral virtue, acquired moral virtue, come, it is, um, is supposed to help provide for the coordination of our powers so that reason and passion and appetite, um, that these things can be an emotional response can be sort of coordinated in a way that doesn't make us feel like we're torn in a million different directions by an unexpected event, okay? And having a hard time figuring out what to do in the face of it, okay? Paradise for us, prelapsarian human nature for Aquinas, involved this sort of perfect coordination of all of our powers in a state that he called original justice, where our you know, so-called lower powers, 
were governed by reason, and reason was subject to God, obedience to God, and the whole system worked together smoothly and well, at least should have worked together smoothly and well. What the fall is for Aquinas is the loss of this sort of harmony, this automatic harmony. It's the loss of original justice. And what that leaves us with isn't chaos. Because the emotions, the appetites, the passions, they're actually kinds of things that are made to be reasonable, even when they're not. Which is one of the reasons that giving oneself a little talking to now and then sometimes helps because they're made to be governed by them. Reason is made to be governed, governed by something higher. And very few of my colleagues would be happy admitting that. But um, <laughs> I'm at a secular institution. <laughs> we, we don't mention God, um, except as a sort of intellectual topic. OK. Um, Now, some aspects of moral psychology, our moral psychology, is directly responsive to things that are genuinely good or bad in our circumstances and our experience. Things as simple as the warmth of the fireside on a cold night, the welcoming embrace of a loved one, the discomfort of a rock in one's shoe, a bad smell that alerts you to trouble those kinds of things. Some aspects are responsive to the difficulty of pursuing or protecting or promoting good, or the difficulty of avoiding bad. These aspects of psychological life, however immediate, can be really complicated. They frequently involve memory, culturally developed, culturally developed tendencies, and sometimes even reflect expert knowledge. You know, a seasoned detective walking around the scene of a murder is going to have a very different sense of the crime than I could get, even if I was working really hard to try to understand what I was seeing, hearing, and smelling. On my reading, it's very helpful to note several things about our immediate responses to our circumstances um, on Aquinas' picture. First, they are geared to tracking good and alerting us to what might, what might impede, block, damage, or otherwise get in the way of something good. The principle that good is to be sought or done and bad avoided shapes our responses at root. This is the first principle of practical reason, the first precept of natural law, and I think um, rightly um, seem to sort of be a required framework for thinking about our lives. Second, our responses to our immediate circumstances can help to incline us to do or keep, us, or keep from doing various things that we might do under those circumstances. And third, given the first two points, these impressions are not only cognitively inflected and capable of grabbing explicit attention, they are sources of motivation that are primed for guidance by reason. So you don't just need the story of the fall and a thought about what happens afterwards to get this. It's part of common experience that even things that are really inconvenient in your psychological responses to the world are made to be susceptible to reason, like reason can govern them. Okay, so when that reason is fully developed and more perfected, you begin to approach having something on the order of practical wisdom. Practical wisdom takes some of its understanding of circumstances from all the other virtues and qualities of character that you have. These are part of what provide a sense about what's supposed to happen under these 
circumstances. But practical reason is supposed to help translate all these things that you walk around with, all these sensitivities to your environment, into appropriate and effective action. So, virtue, all moral virtue, fosters the cooperation and coordination among and across various regions of our psychological life for the sake of helping us pursue good and avoid bad smoothly and reasonably. Now, unlike Aristotle, I mean, I get to be contrary to Aristotle in a crowd like this. I get to, like, prefer the saint. <laughs> I don't get to in most of my professional life. You're not allowed to, to, to Aristotle. He's, amazing. he's of course amazing, right? And he's of course amazing. Um, but unlike Aristotle, Aquinas writes in detail and with considerable acuity and candor about the senses in which even obviously strange or terrible acts or cultivated vicious habits are really aimed at as such desirable things in human life. Okay? It's just that they're disordered in the way that they're directing themselves. And for Aquinas, again, not, not Aristotle, virtue is directed to common good in the first instance, even when it's a virtue like temperance that seems mostly to concern the good of its bearer. Moral virtues help us to have a more ordered psychological life so that we're better able to contribute to and participate in sound social life. Moral virtues help each of us to regulate her emotions and direct herself to appropriate goals. The sphere of moral virtue gives specifically human direction to the formal inclination to pursue good and avoid bad. Now Aquinas recognizes sort of distinct gradations of virtue, of strengths that help us to pursue good and avoid bad reasonably. First, we can have sort of virtuous inclinations by temperament or through education and cultivation. Depending upon how you understand a phrase like natural virtue in Aristotle, these may correspond to Aristotelian natural virtues. On standard readings of Aristotle, however, the naturalness of, the natural, of natural virtue in Aristotle makes it a matter of temperament rather than cultivation. For Aquinas, the crucial point is that mere virtuous inclination got by nature or by nurture in practice need not work in concert with other such inclinations. Mere virtuous inclination is not connected with the work of other admirable qualities or dispositions. I may have strong tendencies to loyalty toward my family, my comrades in arms, my employer, or the members of my club. Loyalty is an important aspect of varieties of social solidarity, crucial to many aspects of shared life. Obviously, there are such tendencies as misplaced loyalties. I have, say, pledged allegiance to a band of thieves or to a tyrant. But even without having thrown in my lot with unsavory company, appropriate loyalties to my family, say, or friends who have stood by me in times of great distress can inspire pretty bad acts on my part depending upon what my intimates have been up to. Without a connected inclination toward justice, even my rightly placed loyalties can as easily be moral weaknesses as moral strengths. Virtue proper is supposed to be a moral strength. It is because practical tendencies like my loyalty need to operate in concert with other virtuous inclinations that mere virtuous inclination falls short of counting as virtue proper for Aquinas. Now, practical rem wisdom is what helps remedy this problem. Isolated virtuous inclinations, whether or not they've been cultivated, are imperfect or incomplete or unfinished virtues. 
It is the connection to justice and honesty, for example, that could complete or perfect my tendencies to loyalty, making my loyalty a moral strength rather than a point of moral weakness. In the second sort of higher gradation, practical wisdom operates to connect the virtue. And here, Aquinas is, I think, very close to Aristotle. Anselm Muller has this to say about Aristotle's treatment of the topic with natural virtue in the place of Aquinas' imperfect virtues. Quote, what natural variant of a virtue shares with the virtue is the characteristic response. What distinguishes it from the virtue is the fact that it's not shaped by wisdom. So the second aspect of an ethical virtue is what right reason brings to it. Namely, it's taking account of circumstances in a wide sense of this word. I mean, it's taking account of, A, the point of practicing that virtue anyway, what the virtue is supposed to contribute to humans living well, and B, the various aspects in which it may, in consequence, be appropriate or inappropriate to exhibit that virtue's characteristic response here and now. It is by bringing to bear on any given situation this knowledge of when and how to respond in this way and when and how not to that any ethical virtue is unqualifiedly good. Sometimes your virtue shows itself most clearly in everything you don't do. Miller thinks, Miller's reading of, of Aristotle on this point is terrific. He thinks that the point of the virtues um, sheds light on both Aristotle's perplexing insistence that virtue directs us to the mean and his frankly demoralizing suggestion that you can't have any virtue without having all of them. Um, Miller writes, we relate the various virtues to a common dimension of assessment generally called morality. This does not, of course, prove that the pursuit of any one virtue cannot ever be inconsistent with the pursuit of another. It does, however, show that such inconsistency would detract from what morality achieves as an ultimate practical standard. The concepts of courage and of justice do not point to independent criteria of assessment in the way that the concepts of morality and etiquette or the concepts of lawfulness and of political correctness do. There is no inconsistency in the rules of etiquette requiring you to do what morality rules out. Genuine inconsistency does, however, seem to obtain if what you do agrees with the common moral standard of acting well because it is courageous and fails to agree because it is unjust. The demands of the many virtues are in this respect like the many rules of football. They all must be kept at the same time, not like alternative recipes for producing cakes. <laughs> um, Aquinas had this to say about natural virtue in Aristotle's account that there is a natural virtue presupposed to moral virtue is obvious from the fact that individual virtuous or vicious practices seem to exist in some people naturally. That's his day. Okay. So for Aquinas, the sort of formal injunction to do and seek good and avoid what's bad gets specifically human context in the basic structure and operation of practical reason operating together with and through the predispositions, dispositions, inclinations, and desires or tendencies toward, for example, shared social life, tendencies that belong to morality. Virtuous tendencies become proper virtues when shaped and guided by discretion or, in, or discrimination, that is, wisdom, really. Virtues proper, guided by practical wisdom, which itself gets its initial juice from Sindaresis, have the dynamic unity we see 
when individuals or groups of people act well. Unlike mere good inclinations, virtuous, uh, virtues operating with discretion make me a good human being. They make me a good person by helping, me, by helping suit me to participate in the daily production and reproduction of sound social life, where the soundness of the sort of social life in question is partly produced by the good tendencies of the participants. Now, I started with an Aristotelian commonplace about the intelligibility of animal movement, which can extend to a commonplace about the intelligibility of biological processes generally. I stress that the commonplace was abstract and formal. It doesn't tell you what you're supposed, what's supposed to happen and what you're supposed to do. All it tells you is that understanding how things are supposed to go with organisms catches us up in an understanding of what is good or bad for a kind of living thing. I stress that the distance between the formal commonplace and how it is that a human being ought to go about providing for herself and for others can seem very great, even though both theory and practice will be rooted in some thought about the sorts of things that it makes sense for a human being to seek and to do, or to shun and flee. Now, I've found Aquinas an especially good teacher on these points. Um, unlike Aristotle, Aquinas devotes considerable attention to explaining what sorts of things are amiss when individuals and groups of people do wrong. Some of his most important writings on practical wisdom all have to do with um, things that block or impede practical wisdom. Unlike Aristotle, um, it's unsurprising that we do wrong, notice, because human beings have to figure things out that our fellow creatures seem to get right. Worse yet, human beings keep having to work out what to go for, what to avoid, and how to seek their good and shun what's bad for them. Early training is usually enough to get other animals off on the right, right foot for the rest of their lives. Human beings are still sorting things out for themselves as adults. Now, the need to figure out how to move toward good or away from bad doesn't seem to vanish with practice for most of us. And Aquinas seems to have operated with a firm understanding that the business of moral self-improvement is ongoing in human life. Um, it's one of the respects in which he sort of parts company with Aristotle. I mean, although he says, yes, of course, early childhood is tremendously important, very, very important, very, very important, he's also having to deal with a figure like Augustine, who was pretty well formed at the point he made a really big shift in his practical orientation. Um, and he's answerable to the canon of the saints, actually which means that he needs to, his, his moral philosophy has a much broader constituency than Aristotle's. This is not a tiny minority of super privileged young men. This is like Mary, right? not a super intellectual. Um, all kinds of people who are saints and beings from whom we have a lot to learn, actually. So you don't want a moral view that makes it out that they can't quite achieve what's really important. Okay. Um, there are the three other aspects of Aquinas' work go to the distinction on practical wisdom, between the two on practical wisdom. First, Aquinas offers an account of natural law which I sort of smuggled into discussion of Sindaresis. Second, as I mentioned, the discussion of how practical wisdom connects virtuous dispositions or predispositions. Again, something that catches up Sindaresis um, is there in Aquinas in a way that it's really not, and at least not on the surface in Aristotle. Next, uh, because he devotes 
a lot of attention to the sense in which acquired virtues operate as cultivated strengths, we get um, a different sense of the structure of the moral psychology in Aquinas than we do in Aristotle, and I think it's actually very helpful. Now, the kind of unity that acquired practical wisdom gives to our efforts is, I think, the dynamic unity of dispositions and predispositions, variously activated and quieted as we move through our days, all ordered to the end of the wholeness of the individual human person living reasonably well-ordered lives with and among their fellows. These strengths should not be thought of as blocky, fixed traits dictating one perfectly determinate fixed sort of act or omission after another and then another. To treat cultivating virtue on the model of building these isolated strengths would be a little like mistaking a weightlifting regime to targeted muscle groups with building a strong body. One doesn't get a strong body by working first one's biceps, then on triceps, then, you know, and so on and so on and so on. You get weirdly hyperdeveloped little muscle groups. Okay. Um, rather, a strong body charged with, say, moving a big rock from one place to the next, or climbing a hill, or playing golf, or walking to school, involves the coordinated and smooth exercise of the whole body. On my reading of Aquinas, the interaction and coordination of virtues in the human personality is like the exercise of a strong body at work or at play. My practical wisdom, if I have any, anchored in natural reason and synderesis, taking some of its ends from the kind of awareness of my world that I get from such moral virtues as I happen to have, stops me from doing some things just as bodily strength can help me stop at an appropriate point when running to the edge of the cliff. Practical wisdom can help me to access wider regions of my practical repertoire than I have in the past when I need to figure out how to cope with a novel problem quickly, just as experience climbing and jumping might weak men help me get over a fallen tree on the trail. And throughout, practical wisdom helps me to bring what I have to bear on the challenge of acting well from one day to the next, of working with and among my fellow beings in pursuit of common good and avoidance of what's bad for all of us.